Firepower Management Center, FMC 101. This session is focused on deploying Firepower Threat Defense using Firepower Management Center. The version used in this session is 622, and we build out this topology from start to finish in the session. This includes the following, an outside host, the scary internet, Firepower Threat Defense on the internet edge, a management network with Firepower Management Center, Cisco Firepower User Agent, and Active Directory. This includes users and groups. We also have an inside network with a couple of hosts that are part of AD and are leveraging a dynamic NAT to get outside to the internet. We also have a span session, tapping the network passively. And we can build policy again. This is running at the same time as the rest of the configuration. We have inline sets where we may have a control point between a couple of assets in the same layer two network. In this case, we are using a virtual switch and I have two port groups, a VLAN 198 and VLAN 98 that create the inline set and allows for policy and additional inspection. We have a DMZ with a web server that is going to do static NAT. So we're going to offer this service not only to the internal hosts, but also out to the internet. And we're going to do this all within an hour and a half from start to finish. Okay, let's build this and have some fun. So all I've done up to this point is I've deployed the OVF file, but no configurations have been completed. So I've done the base OVF deployment and that is it. So first we will configure Firepower Management Center. So we're gonna log in with admin and the password is admin123 with a capital A. And then we're going to go into the configuration mode to complete the configuration. So that's sudo configure-network. And we're gonna give it an IP address, net mask, and gateway. Again, enter the password here, right? Love the little comments there. Respect the privacy of others. Think before you type. And with great power comes great responsibility. So we're going to do IPv4. We'll enter in the management IP. The net mask is 255.255.255.0 and the gateway address. Are these configuration settings correct? Yes, they are. And we're not going to configure IPv6 in this case. So to finish off Firepower Management Center, we will go into a web GUI. Um, so before we do that though, let's get the pre-configuration of Firepower Threat Defense there uh, complete. Again, you log in with admin, password admin123. You accept the end user license agreement. That is um, by saying yes, right? Make sure you read it thoroughly. We'll enter a new password here. And now we want to configure IPv4. We're not going to do IPv6. It's going to be manual. We'll enter the IP address of the device. We'll include the net mask and we'll add the gateway address. We will give the serve or the the firepower at threat defense platform uh, host name, so an FQDN here. And you can see here that Cisco Umbrella I, uh, DNS is, is available, right? So you can use this uh, as the DNS server. In our case, we, we're gonna use an internal DNS server, um, but that's already there for you and ready to go. You can put in the uh, domain search domains as well. And there's a link to learn more about Umbrella if you choose to understand uh, what Umbrella has beyond just DNS or recursive DNS. 
All right, so this is gonna take a few seconds to get done or completed, right? The configuration is building. Once complete, we're gonna have an option to uh, how we wanna manage the device. In our case, we're gonna manage it using Firepower Management Center. So we're not gonna have local management. You will see a Firepower um, or Firepower Device Management 101 um, gonna be released shortly after the Firepower Management Center 101. So in this case, it's gonna be no, because we're gonna manage the device um, using the centralized manager. So, and the one thing people don't realize, Firepower Management Center is, is a centralized manager, but it's also an analytics platform, right? Focused on threats and, and context. So here we're gonna go firewall mode is gonna be routed because we are at the internet edge in this case. Right, but you could do a layer two or transparent mode firewall if you wanted to. And here we're gonna add the Firepower Management Center, right? So we're telling Firepower Threat Defense that we want this manager to manage our device. So configure, manager, add, the IP address of Firepower Management Center, and then the uh, shared secret. All right, that's it for the pre-configuration to get the box boxes accessible and being able to be managed. So what we'll do now is we're gonna fire up a web browser and we're actually gonna co uh, configure Firepower Management Center itself. So we'll go HTTPS 10.1.254.200. We'll accept the certificate warning. You can create a trusted certificate uh, to FMC if desired, right? We'll log in with admin and the password again is admin123 uppercase A. And we'll have an opportunity to change that at this point in time. So we'll enter a new password. We'll confirm the settings um, that we've already completed in the pre-configuration. We'll change the host name. We'll put in the domain. We'll put in our primary DNS server. And in most cases, you would have a secondary. I don't in my case. Uh, this is just a lab environment. We can then go in and configure our time settings, right? So we use NTP traditionally, but you can enter your own here. Um, you can change the time zone. Select whatever is appropriate for you. And we can do uh, rule updates, geolocation updates, automatic backup. We'll do some of that during the configuration. Um, licensing we're going to do later. And now you do accept the end user license agreement. As always, read it thoroughly like we all do. Um, and then select apply. Now this will take a couple of seconds to finalize the configuration. And what we'll do now is we'll uh, look at our topology. So at this point, we have deployed Firepower Threat Defense. We've tied it to Firepower Management Center for management. Uh, we have completed the base configuration of FMC. And we, need, we now need to add Firepower Threat Defense to FMC. And then we will uh, start tackling the configuration one step at a time. Right? Remember, with Firepower Threat Defense, we told it what manager we want to be managed by, but we haven't actually added the device to the manager itself. So there's lots to do in this, this session. Right, I, I try to include as much as possible um, to empower you folks to complement you know, the guide with a video that you can walk through. So here we're gonna enable licensing. So here, if you had smart licensing, you would just go in and register. In my case, I'm just using the evaluation license. Now there's a link there that you can jump to learn more about smart licensing. Basically, smart licensing provides greater flexibility by removing the license from the device. This allows you to move the license to the appropriate device as needed. Okay, 
So now let's get started here, right? So let's go to device management and add firepower threat defense. At the same time, let's go to firepower threat defense console and run show managers. You can see that it's pending. All right, let's add a device here. So we'll add the host. We'll give it a display name. You can use the IP if you like or give it something more meaningful. We'll add the reg key. This will be the same as what we entered earlier in Firepower Threat Defense. And we need to add a policy, but we don't have one created. Uh, the nice thing about Firepower is we can do this from here. We don't have to jump out of here, go to Access Control Policy and build a brand new policy. Now, in this case, we're gonna create a vanilla policy with the default action of block. Because this is gonna be deployed as a next-gen firewall, not a next-gen IPS, obviously the action typically would be block. All right, now that we've got it created, we actually have to apply it, okay? So make sure you go back and make sure that that drop-down list says the, the policy that you created and now include the licensing that you wanna license the product for. Now this will take some time to add the device. So let's jump to Firepower Threat Defense and show managers. And what we'll see is it says it's still pending. Now we'll run it again a couple of times. Again, you don't need to do this necessarily unless maybe the device was not getting added or if you had some issues that you might have to start troubleshooting. But at this point in time, I'm doing it to give you additional insight into what's actually happening, right? Instead of just showing you the configurations, I'm, I'm showing you the results of some of that, right? Um, so build a policy, test the policy. So in this case, add a add a man or a device to the manager and let's see the result. Now we can see that it is completed. So at least from Firepower Threat Defense or the NGFW or NGIPS's perspective, it's actually added to the proper manager or the manager that you wanted to add. Now, there's still some stuff that's happening in the back end here, right? It's uh, looking at the configuration, what it is, and establishing the connection, blah, 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 right? So that's all happening. But we're not at the mercy of this taking place. Like, we can now jump into configurations uh, and move forward uh, with things that we need in order to make the solution effective. So while that's continually uh, being added, now I'm going to jump in to build out a bunch of objects. Now, this is going to be probably the longest task that we are going to do, um, at least in this session. And it's because we're building all of the objects by scratch, right? If you were migrating from ASA, what you would do is you would leverage the migration tool and these objects would be created for you as part of the migration process. So you can see we've added an object already, right? And we're gonna go through. So we've got the DNS server built, right? The object, and again, the idea here is to build the object uh, once and use it many times, right? And you're gonna see that throughout the platform is a lot of times you're gonna go in and build whatever it is that you're gonna build um, in objects or even some policy and then they're gonna be able to be used all over the platform, right? Over and over again. So let's build out inside host one and we'll also build out inside host two. And as you can see, Firepower Management Center is working away, right? We're getting messages on the side there as we continue to add these objects. All right, so now we've got a couple objects. Let's do the PCI network, I think is a good place to start um, now. Now, just kind of visualize the topology or pause and go back and look at it. I, I do uh, reference it throughout the session. Um, but again, we've already done a little bit of the inside, right? We've done the actual host objects. Now we're doing the PCI environment and we're doing its host objects. And we could also create uh, a group, right? So we could say PCI host one, PCI host two is part of a group called PCI. 
I'm not going to do this in this session. I think it's self-explanatory at this point, but you get the idea. Now we'll do uh, host two, and then what we'll do is we'll mo move on to adding the web server and the DMZ. So again, apply the IP addressing. And now we'll add that web server in the DMZ. And like I said, right, this is this is takes a little bit of time, right? And the more objects you have, obviously the longer this is gonna take. So now we've got a couple of host objects. Um, let's create a couple network objects that are uh, the entire network. So the inside network, for example. And this will be a slash 24. And again, you can see the messages at the top coming in. Um, I know we've zoomed in a little bit here, but you can still see them pop, pop, popping up every once in a while. Let's do the DMZ network as well. And again, you could have, um, if, say for example, if you went and bought the next gen firewall or next gen IPS platforms and haven't received the devices and you're managing it with the virtual uh, manager, you could actually um, start building out the configuration before your devices are there, right? You can go in and start building out a lot of the objects within Firepower Management Center that you're gonna leverage. So now that we have it, all the, the objects, at least in this lab that, that we're uh, building here, um, configured, now we'll move back to the device and make sure that it's added. And we can see that it is, which is great. Right, so the device is added. We haven't lost any time, right? We've been building since we've started. Um, and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add additional interfaces. Now, because we're using a virtual offering, right? We've got a couple other networks. I'm not doing a trunked port. Um, and um, so we're gonna have to build or add a couple more interfaces. In my case, what how we're gonna do that because we're using a virtual platform is we're gonna add a couple more interfaces to the uh, virtual machine. So again, folks that have a physical platform, you can certainly skip this section um, because obviously the interfaces will already be available to you in the, er, in the manager. In my case, like I said, we're gonna have to add a couple. So let's do uh, first our inline sets, interfaces. So we have uh, the first NIC VLAN A to B, and then we'll do VLAN B to C, or I mean, sorry, B to A. And, and the other thing to note here, these networks I've actually created ahead of time, right? So I went into V the V switch and created a couple of port groups. All right, so that's good. We've got that created. Now let's create a, in my case, I'm gonna use a, uh, a trunk port that has multiple VLANs on it, and we're gonna span that um, essentially to the virtual firepower threat defense. Now this could be a, a, a span port that comes off of a switch, right? And, and plugged in. In my case, I, I've got VMware um, and, and this is a way of, of getting visibility into multiple different um, networks. And again, it's span, so it's gonna be effectively an I, IDS, right? And the next thing we need to do is restart that device. So while this is rebooting, right, again, we're not at the mercy of waiting for this to happen, right, we can continue to build policy or other uh, configuration items. So the first one we're gonna do is platform settings. So we grab firepower threat defense platform setting. Um, this ensures consistent configuration of device settings. We will leverage a firepower threat defense platform policy because this is the device that we're actually leveraging in this lab. Uh, you can see here a bunch of options, right? So once we, we add the device over and I say save, you're gonna see a variety of options here. Now, we can go in and configure a banner, for example, but you can see that 
because there's a lot of options here to configure, you can get some consistency across the entire organization. One of the biggest items in here is to make sure time synchronization is done properly, right? Especially when it comes to uh, security and investigating a breach, you wanna make sure that it's consistent. So save that out. If you wanted to assign a policy, you can just click policy assignment and add additional devices. We already did that from the very beginning. and we could hit deploy, right? Now, you're gonna see as I go through, we're gonna build some configuration and then we're gonna deploy. You could have built a whole lot of configuration all up front and wait for the deploy. The difference is I wanna see the change and the behavior of that change, right? I wanna test it. Here, we're gonna create a health policy, okay? So this allows us to ensure consistent health policies across our platforms. Uh, please note that both platform and health policies can be configured and assigned accordingly. You may have to be or may have specific needs based on where the device resides and therefore Cisco Firepower accommodates that, right? Because I can create multiple different health policies and platform policies, right? As you can see, there's a bunch of health policies here that you can configure um, and disable or, or, or enable, right? You have the ability to tweak some of these as well. At the end of the day, interface status, what you can see is on. You're gonna see that a lot in, in at least the lab environment, right? If I don't see traffic on an interface, we're gonna alert you. In production, that's probably something that you want to have, right? Because most interfaces should be receiving traffic. So we'll save the policy, right? And again, make sure that you have it assigned, right? We can see a couple of health uh, messages up there, that little uh, yellow triangle with two. And here we are making sure that the devices that we want are assigned to this policy. And again, we can hit apply here. And now it's fetching that those, uh, th those new interfaces from the device. And what we'll end up getting is a message that the interface configuration has changed. So what we'll wanna do is click save. And now we're really, in, in uh, are going to start configuring the interfaces themselves. So we'll configure the interfaces um, as our topology requires. And the first one we're gonna configure is the outside interface. So you can see a couple choices here, right? Passive, ER span, and none. In this case, it's a layer three interface and it is um, gonna be configured as the outside interface. So we'll give it a name, we'll create the zone, we'll call that outside-zone. Again, this is an object that could have been pre-created uh, already in the objects management um, tab, but in this case, we haven't created any, right? And again, we don't have to jump out of this interface and go create it, we were able to do it from here. The one thing to note is make sure that you enable that interface, okay? We'll give it an IP address of 10.1.253.99 slash 24. You can see IPv6, we have advanced settings, we have hardware configuration settings that could be tweaked as well. Okay. Looks good. Now let's move to the inside interface. And again, it's more the same now, right? This is just becomes a repetitive process, at least for the layer three interfaces. Create the zone. We could give it a description as well. And we'll give it an IP address of 192.168.99.1 slash 24. And again, you have advanced configurations, IPv6, et cetera, right? Click OK. Now I'm gonna to jump to the, uh, the DMZ now and we'll create that. Again, it's more the same, right? It's a layer three interface. We need a zone assigned to it. We wanna enable the interface. We're gonna give it an IP address of 192.168.66.1 slash 24. Make sure that's enabled. I see that missed every once in a while. 
and you're obviously going to hit OK. So now we've got the three layer three interfaces configured. So let's move on to the span interface. And we'll click edit. And this time the mode is going to be passive. We give it a name of passive. We create a zone called passive dash zone. Ensure to enable the interface. But notice one thing, that we do not have any IP addressing or very little uh, additional tabs, right? We have hardware configuration and that's it. So pretty good so far. So quickly look at the topology and refresh uh, what we need in regards to inline sets. Okay, remember pause if you need to. Okay, time to configure the first interface. So all we'll do is give it a name and enable it. And again, give it something meaningful, right? That you understand and keep that naming convention throughout. Um, we'll do that to the second interface. Remember, we're gonna tie these two interfaces together, right? And we're gonna show that later on. So now that we have the uh, two interfaces created. Now you'll see I, I hit save a lot and that's to do with coming from the command line, right? Copy, run, start, or, or write, mem, etc. right? You're always save, save, save as you move along. Um, so here I'm gonna create an inline set. So we'll add the interfaces. Perfect. And you can see there's others there that, that you could uh, modify. But if you do this, it clears the configuration outside of what we already did. And you can see additional things like tap mode settings, propagate link state, uh, strict TCP enforcement, snort fail open. So there's some advanced configurations that you may want to do. Now this is giving us a warning to let us know that any existing security zone mappings, etc., would be removed. And that's why we didn't do any of that. So now we'll go back to those interfaces and we'll finalize the configuration. So we'll create a zone. Remember this is inline A. So we'll create an inline A zone. And again, you only have the two tabs as opposed to all the layer three stuff that you get when you have a layer three interface. And this one's gonna be inline dash B dash zone. Perfect. We'll save that out. And again, we're doing a lot of different things, right? And we haven't actually deployed it to the device yet, right? So this doesn't have any impact until we deploy or change, right? Maybe a better word. It actually hasn't changed the device yet. So let's do some routing, right? So you can see multiple dynamic routing protocols supported, but we just need a simple default static route. So we're going to add a route, select the outside interface, and we leverage any IPv4 for the selected network. And now we need to create a gateway object. In our case, the IP is 10.1.253.1. You have some additional options available like route tracking. Um, in our case, we don't need that. But first, make sure that you add that object that you just created. Click Save. And maybe this is a good time to deploy. Now we can see the settings that we're pushing. While this deploys, we can continue using the manager to build out additional configuration items. And we're going to do that. So we're well on our way, right? We've got our interfaces created. We've got routing set up. We've now deployed the configuration. And what we can do now is we can jump to building out the NAT policy. 
Now, I'm not gonna build out the entire NAT policy all up front, right? I'm just gonna do the very simple inside to outside dynamic NAT. So let's add a threat defense NAT policy. We'll give it a name. Okay, again, something meaningful. Make sure the device is added, or you can add it later. Right there with policy assignment. Let's add a rule. We will create a dynamic auto NAT rule. And we're gonna use the inside to outside zones. For translation, the original source is the inside network object. And the translated packet is the outside interface. And that's it. Let's save the configuration. Hit OK. Hit Save. Quickly reviewing what we've done up to this point. Right, we can see the one NAT rule at this point. We will do another one later uh, for the DMZ uh, in that static NAT rule for the web servers. So now that we've saved it, Again, we can deploy this and continue to build out uh, additional policies if we wanted to, right? Or we could jump into additional policies and just keep building and then push this all out together, right? Doesn't really matter. There's no right or wrong way per se, right? It's, it just depends on what policies you're pushing and when and, um, and the impact that may occur while you're pushing policies, right? To make sure that you understand what's taking place. All right, so that's deploying. I think at this point we can let that do what it's doing um, and we'll jump to policies, access control and intrusion. So the first FMC 101 that I've done in the past, I was really focused on network only. Um, so we didn't uh, actually talk about IPS or malware. In this case, we're gonna add both of those elements and we're gonna look at, um, there's a couple of default policies. So there's balance security and connectivity. There's connectivity over security. So connectivity is more important than security. Then you have security over connectivity. Now, most people start with balanced security and connectivity. Um, they start with that and then they tune, they use firepower recommendations to further tune that um, later. So let's start from there. And I'm going to, what I'm gonna do is, I, I'm gonna jump into some of the rules just to show you how easy it is to add additional rule sets um, if you wanted to. So if you wanna modify that default policy that you're using, you're right, in our case, balance security and connectivity, and add a couple of other things that are important to your organization, whether that's specific rule sets for specific um, assets like web servers or database servers, etc. right, outside of the default. Or it's um, other things like, um, and, and, and I'm gonna show you here, you either wanna enable more of the malware type policies or exploit kits that um, um, lots are enabled by default, but there's some that aren't, right? So you can search based on category, etc. Here, all we did was put in the word malware, and now we're gonna drop and generate events for all of those. Um, and again, it took a second to, to, to actually, you know, search for those and, and run that um, uh, rule change against all of them. Now here we'll do exploit kits or exploit kit. And we'll drop and generate events. Now you see the green arrow um, turn into red. So on the right side, they were uh, green, some of them. And now they're all red, right? Because we're saying drop generate events. And you can see that drop when in line is checked. So we're actually gonna drop, if you match a signature, we're actually gonna drop. Now, please note that, that since this IPS policy is not assigned to an access policy and not deployed to an NGFW or NGIPS, nothing is being inspected at this stage. We will, do the, we will deploy this shortly, right? But first we need to apply it to an access policy before we can do anything. Because at this point, they're really just advanced objects, right? Uh, they're an IPS policy object that can be leveraged in access control policy. So here we're gonna create a malware and file policy. So we'll give it a name and we'll add a few rules. So let's add a rule. 
And here we can be very, very granular, right? And you should be. Again, just because uh, all the attributes are available, you don't need to use them all, but you wanna be granular where it makes sense. So you could be HTTP, pick the protocol, and then upload or download, or both, right? Here we're just gonna detect files. Now you can see I just grabbed everything and I moved it over. And then there's a couple that I can quickly delete because I don't need to do uh, file analysis or detect those files. Uh, and click OK. So now I'll detect all those file types, right? So now I just get a good idea of the sense of files that are in my organization. Now here what I wanna do is I want to build out a policy to block malware. So the most restrictive applies, right? Just, just because I detect, if, if it falls under a malware policy that has a block, we're gonna block. So Spiro is a machine learning for executables. Dynamic analysis is our outside looking in sandbox called threat grid. Capacity handling, this in case, uh, this is for if we can't submit to the cloud, it'll store the file and submit in later time. Local malware analysis is high fidelity sig signatures. We can reset the connection. And in our case, we wanna store malware in unknown files. We can save it. And then this needs to be applied just like the next gen uh, our IPS uh, policy that we created to an access policy. Until then, nothing's happening, right? It's just uh, an advanced object, for lack of better words or term, um, that is enabled. Now we can see here a couple of health alerts being triggered, right? And this is uh, typical in a lab environment. We see the interfaces are not receiving any um, packets and it's because they don't have very many hosts. Okay, so we've jumped back into our interfaces. Now we can see that they're all green. Right, so that looks pretty good. And again, there's that health alert saying that we're not receiving any packets on specific interfaces. Again, expected in this lab environment. In production, there could be something else going on, right? Most likely you have packets flowing uh, across those interfaces at all times. Again, if you didn't wanna see that alert, like in this case, you can go to the health policy and then uh, uh, disable that alert. In a lab environment, maybe you wanna do that. In production, probably not. Okay, so we've got those interfaces. Uh, they're all showing green, they're all built. We've got some access policies um, configured. But before we go, let's just before we assign the IPS policies, let's go into security intelligence, okay? And let's go to access policy, or sorry, security intelligence, and we can see that we're not seeing any of the intelligent feeds comes in, okay? I jump back out and in just to see if there's a change. That means something's wrong, and we're gonna come back to that in a second, right? There could be a slight delay, but in most cases, there's something maybe blocking upstream. So we'll come back, we'll troubleshoot that, maybe offline, but. Um, I, I'm showing that because I see that from time to time in some environments, right? So let's add a rule in the meantime. And we're gonna do inside to outside zones. And we're gonna grab the inside network object as a source. Okay, but we could have a destination network if we want to, but in this case, we don't need it. Um, we'll give it a name. This is gonna be monitor all URLs. And what that's gonna do is it'll monitor and then move on to the next rule. So there's no block, but it will monitor, right? Or there's no really allow, right? Because it's just monitoring it. And all we have to do is add a single URL over um, and it'll start capturing, right? Because it has to look at the URLs at that point in time. In this case, we are going to add the uncategorized and the any except uncategorized. Okay, for the, for, um, when, when you build out these policies, the one thing you can see there's a lot of options, zones, networks, VLANs, users, applications, ports, URLs, secure group tags with ICE for ICE attributes, and then you've got your advanced inspections. You wanna use as little as possible, right? All you need to do is uniquely define 
the flow. Once you do that, that's all you need to add. So don't go crazy adding all kinds of different attributes because it's just going to be uh, increase the amount of 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 a performance degradation on the box, right? There's no need for it. You just got to uniquely identify it. So we've added our two URL categories, right? So we have accept uncategorized, reputations one to five, and uncategorized. And you can see logging is set to end of connection. And quickly reviewing that rule. Now let's add another one. So this is going to be inside to outside zone. We will use the inside network object as the source. We'll give it a name. This will be a threat inspection policy. Right? Again, there's lots of attributes that you can leverage, but use only what you need to uniquely identify the flow. Okay, again, it's allow. So here we're going to add some inspection. So inside to outside is allowed, right? There's nothing really being blocked, but we are going to do IPS and we're going to do malware and, and, and file inspection. And we're going to log at end of connection. Now, one thing to note here, logging every connection event is not necessary to generate alerts. Security intelligence, IPS, and malware still generate events regardless of the connection logging settings. As you can see, the icons highlighted in yellow indicate the IPS and file and malware policies have been enabled for this specific rule. IPS shown as the shield and file and malware policy shown as a group of files. And here what we're going to do is go to the HTTP response and we're going to generate a block page and we're going to use the system provided one, but we can also go in and um, uh, create a custom one. Also, if you look at the advanced settings tab, leverage the documentation, right? Uh, if you don't know what these settings are, go ahead and use help and, 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 and get a better understanding of it. For the most part, we don't change anything here by default, right? Uh, for most environments, unless required. Now, I will come back and make one change to one of them after once we troubleshoot the security intelligence feeds, but you got to stay tuned for that. All right, so now we have, uh, again, we're checking security intelligence. We see that it's not working. Um, again, this could be due to upstream filtering, uh, configuration issues, etc. But we're going to deploy in the meantime. And at this point, while it's being deployed, uh, let's go to and look at connection events. So we don't see anything just yet. Um, and the table view connection events provide additional insight into the event and allows for additional attributes to be added as columns. So when we went back to application with details, we can now, or connection with the application details, we can now start seeing some of the events coming in with the passive zone being blocked. Right, so now we know we know that the uh, next gen firewall, at least the IPS component, is functioning properly. Right, we have some other blocks based on policy or the current policy itself. Now let's go to the table view connection events, and when you hit that X, you now get all these columns. But the one thing you have to be aware of is when you hit that X, you actually disable or remove that initial column. So go back and check it if you require it. But you can see additional um, uh, columns that are available. Like it's tremendous the amount of data that you have. In our case, we're gonna add a bunch of QoS stuff and we're gonna use that later on. Again, you've got SSL, user agent, web application category, etc. And then we click apply. So it's time to get a machine to generate traffic from the inside network to the outside. All right, let's get some news, right? Let's get our daily fix of news. And perfect. So I know for a fact that the inside to outside is actually working, right? So 
So let's look at the logs, right? We're gonna do this a lot. We're gonna come back in and check the logs to make sure that um, you know what we're seeing, even though the result appears to be working, I want you to be able to come back and reference that to the logs itself. So again, we can see a lot of the DMZ stuff uh, happening here with block, right? That's expected. There's no policy to allow that at this point in time. Um, but the one thing to note here is, is when you're logging every connection event, you, you're going to drown in here, right? So if you think you're going to test something, click, go, and then jump back into connection log events and be able to see exactly that flow without using search or edit the search criteria, um, you got to be kidding, right? Like there's just too many connection events that would be taking place. So make sure that you use the uh, searching capabilities of the platform. You can see here, lots of lock, right? And a lot to, of this has to do with, um, you know, that passive zone that we've got enabled. It's actually seeing everything and then there's no policies at this point in time. So from here, let's edit the search and let's be a little more granular in what we're looking for. So in this case, we go to networking and we enter the IP address of the host and then we can click search. We can also save the search here, right? So if you're looking for things very specifically, it could be malicious URLs, as you can see on the left side, right? Um, but you can save these out once you build them and reuse them. Okay, once this comes up, once we generate the uh, filtered search, we can now see very quickly the allow. We can see the inside hose. And as we scroll across, we can see the HTTP request, right? The Internet Explorer, the version of Internet Explorer, right? The application, the medium risks, right? So the risk of that application itself. Scroll across, we can see the URI or URL. Um, we can see access control policies, right? The 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 device that it's coming from. And here, the, there's those QoS fields. Now, again, we're not dropping anything at this point in time. We're not even leveraging QoS. Um, so, uh, but we will, and we'll come back to that very shortly. All right, let's go back at this point and check out that security intelligence. So I had um, an upstream issue that I had to resolve, and I've, I've certainly done that. Um, and again, this is just to show you that um, just if you're not seeing things like uh, security intelligence feeds coming inbound, most likely it's got to do with something in your environment filtering that. And you can check the guides if you're looking for specific outbound access and what's required to get those uh, security intelligence feeds. All right, so now look at that. Now we're good. Uh, now we can add these. Okay, so now these, in our case, um, and in most environments, they're gonna block these, right? Now you can do networks like we've done here. Uh, and the reason why people block these mostly is they trust the intelligence that's coming in, right? And here we'll add the blacklist, right? And, and once we do that, um, this is gonna happen as it's getting updated, right? Here we make sure the logging's where we want it to be. You hit save. Right, we can see that default policy. Let's just go back in here. And now we'll jump to network discovery, right? So everything's good. We are going to uh, remove the any network, but we are gonna keep the IPv6 because we wanna just capture anything internally that's IPv6. Um, a lot of people don't realize that they don't think they're running IPv6, but they actually are. And here we're going to be very granular. So what we want to do is we want to discover hosts, operating systems, users, and applications. This is key in understanding the environment in order to effective or to be effective and minimize the noise. That's a challenge with most IPSs, right? They really don't understand what they're protecting. Um, so we'll keep the IPv6. We'll add host users and we'll add those inside objects, the objects or the environment that we uh, trust even if it's semi-trust, right? But we want to discover all of those assets. And again, it's good to know it's Windows 2003 running IIS version, version 7. That way when a threat comes in, we understand the operating system, the application, and potentially the vulnerabilities. 
Here, this is our ability to pull user identity out of clear text protocols. So for example, I can pull out the user identity of a guest network if someone was using FTP, right? Um, I can do that in uh, the uh, non-guest environment as well, right? Or the corporate environment. The advanced settings for network discovery, actually this is what I meant earlier uh, around advanced settings, is that uh, I wanna capture the banner, right? So the banner itself is things like Apache and the version, right? And that just helps me again, understand the asset that I'm protecting. The more you know, the better you can protect. And if you don't know some of these settings, which you most likely won't know all of them, right? Use help. So it's time to go back to object management and check out variable sets, right? Um, so variable sets provide deeper accuracy in terms of detection and reduce the amount of noise. It's critical that you populate variable sets with information that reflects your environment. And you should also update your variable sets as your environment changes. So for example, majority of the rules use the variable home net to specify the protected network and a variable called external network to specify an unprotected or outside network. So also specialized rules often use other predefined variables. For example, rules that detect exploits against web servers use HTTP servers and HTTP ports. Uh, those variables, right? So rules are more effective when variables more accurately ref reflect your network environment. At a minimum, you should modify default variables in a def in the default set or create your own, right? In this case, I'm modifying the default, but you should create your own um, if you just want to copy the default and then apply it. By ensuring that the variable set as home net correctly defines your network and say HTTP servers include all web servers on your network, processing is optimized and all relevant systems are monitored for suspicious activity. In this case, I've just shown you DNS and home net, but you would go through here and add, you know, FTP, HTTP, um, etc. right? As much more that you can add here, the better. And again, this now is applied to... Um, the uh, policies that that variable set is uh, been associated with. And I just wanted to include that to make sure that folks know that that's available. Now I'm trying to do as much in this as possible. Um, this platform can do a lot, right? It's more than a next gen firewall or next gen IPS, right? There's things in it that we can do like rule correlation, etc., and just don't have enough time to go through everything. But here, what we're gonna do is the rule updates. So we're gonna reapply all policies after rule updates, uh, import completes, and then we're gonna make sure that we have recurring and we're gonna schedule this off peak hours. Now, when you're reapplying the policy after an update, you probably want to have this scheduled at low, low uh, uh, peak times, right? So that's the rule updates. Now we'll jump to geolocation. Again, very much the same here, right? We're going to download and install the geolocation update from the site, and then we're also going to pick a specific time to do the update. So we've made a bunch of changes at this point in time. So we can save this and we can go ahead and uh, deploy. Now again, when you deploy policy, you can drop down that box to get an idea of what changes are gonna be pushed. Right, it gives you an overview of what elements are going to be changed. And again, just because it's deploying a policy, we can still build configuration. So as before, let's go to the connection events. Okay, we're gonna do that a lot, right? We're gonna make change, then we're gonna come in and um, uh, jump to connection events. Now, what you'll notice here is when this populates, you're gonna see that the host icon is grayed out. Now remember, we built that network discovery policy. Now this is gonna help us identify the environment and, and give us an understanding of what we're protecting. So you can see these are grayed out. So this means it's not enabled for those networks, right? 
Blue means profiled. So if they're actually blue, um, it means that we've profiled it. Red means the asset has an indication of compromise. And gray means the asset has not been profiled. Once the policy is deployed, this should change for our internal assets, okay? Because that's the policy that we just finished configuring um, shortly. Okay, let's refresh where things are at. We have an inside to outside complete, and we will move on to the span or tap configuration. Now we can see the events, the connection events show up and we can see some blocks. Let's create an access control policy for the span or the tap traffic, right? So basically in my case, I'm gonna build a policy where I'm actually not blocking anything because it's IDS anyway, and you're not gonna block, you're not actively blocking, even though the it says it would have blocked it. Um, but it is creating a bunch of noise. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create the source zone um, as that passive zone. Again, I can leverage any of the attributes as I see fit. I'll give it a na name of inspect um, dash passive zone. And then um, the action's gonna be allowed, but what I can do here is I can add that IPS and follow file policy. So I can see in other areas of the environment that might not be directly traversing the next gen firewall or next gen IPS, I can actually see if I have some intrusions taking place and or malware running on the network. I wanna log at the end of connection. And again, rule placement's important, right? Um, in this case, we've got an attribute in here that, that uniquely defines it. Um, but if you had something like any above this, then this policy would never get hit. So make sure that you're placing these in the correct spot. Hit save. And again, we can go ahead and deploy. Now we've done a lot up to this point, right? We're plugging away. We've got some inside to outside configured. We've got the span now. We've just finished uh, completing that configuration. And we've got lots more to do, right? But we've done a fair bit. We've got the box up and running and we've got uh, you know, production data right? Mine is lab, but we got production data going through it. So let's fire up a VM and check the DMZ from the inside. Now we'll connect to the web server and the DMZ, which happens to be 192.168.66.100. Now, most of you are already know that this will not work. Why? Well, there's no policy allowing the inside to the DMZ but let's confirm this by looking at the connection logs, okay, or connection events, right? We, we know that based on the results we see here, right? We don't see that page being rendered. But again, I just wanna make sure that we're looking at the connection events and we're actually seeing that behavior or that result uh, on the uh, connection log events as well, right? So let's hit it a couple more times Right, so we can generate a couple of uh, events themselves. But it's good to come back and correlate this, especially if the platform is new, right? There's a lots of different ways of blocking traffic as opposed to a traditional L3, L4 firewall. So we can see some block here, but that's not the traffic that we're interested in, right? We're trying to find the inside to the DMZ. Now we can see from the DMZ uh, to other networks, it's being blocked, right? We can see the passive zones, um, again, being blocked. That'll change as that policy got pushed, right? But you can see here, look at that. That's a blue uh, icon. That means we've profiled the device. And we can see it's a Windows 7 machine. We can see the applications running on it, right? Make this a little bit bigger. Look at all the applications and the versions. Again, very important when you're mitigating risk, right? We want to understand the threat and whether or not it could ever been realized on the asset. And look at this. We've, we've pulled down passively the vulnerabilities that could be associated with that asset. Now, you could tie this into a third-party vulnerability scan and get real-time uh, information about that, about those vulnerabilities on that asset.
So let's create that rule, right? We saw that block statement just a second ago. And now we'll build out that inside to DMZ zone rule and we'll take maybe the inside network and we could be very granular here if we wanted to right we can all actually just grab the um the web server in the dmz right not even the dmz network itself now what we'll do here is again i'm going to leverage lots of different ways of building policy there's no right or wrong way per se as long as you can uniquely identify uh, the flow itself uh, and based on the needs of the organization so here i'm going to do application so i'll do http https and http 2.0 the server only has http running it doesn't have uh, tls or sl ssl um, now here, I might wanna create a very specific web-based IPS policy, right? I'm gonna use security over connectivity because I haven't created one, um, but you get the idea, right? I can now say, okay, this is for a web farm and therefore I have specific things in the web farm that I may want a specific IPS policy um, for that environment and you can do that. Again, placement of the rule is very, very important. Make sure logging is at end of connection. And now we can quickly review that rule. You see allow and we can see the little yellow icon there with the shield. We can save this out. And we can deploy. Now that'll get pushed out. As that's getting pushed out, what we could do now is again, get ready to look at the events themselves. So connection, connection events. And remember before, right, uh, all those connection events, it, it makes it a little more difficult to find that block rule, right? Um, and we were able to, because I have a lab environment, um, but in most environments, you're never gonna be able to find that, right, very easily. Unless you're being, you know, that, that r rule is being triggered uh, a lot, right? So here, let's just be a little more granular and we'll just look for initiator IP of that inside host. And that's going to make life a little bit easier for us when searching, even in a lab environment. So we can see a lot of blocks here, and that's from the previous um, uh, connection attempts. And here, right away, we can see it's already uh, enabled. Now we're able to get to that DMZ uh, server. So let's hit it a couple more times, um, and then we'll refresh the connection logs here. And we should, if everything's working as expected, we should be able to see an allow. And here we go, perfect. So again, and you can see, wow, that that host has already been profiled, right? A couple of connection events, and we've already profiled that device. And look, oh, let me bounce back to that. There we go. Um, you can see here, right version of Linux already, right? right vendor it's running apache 2418 right again the more you know about that asset the better you can protect it all right so topology check so we have completed the inside to the outside the inside to the dmz and the span we include some ips and file policies and have a working solution at this point So let's move on to creating the application rate limiting policy. So first, let's check bbc.com because that's the application I'm going to use. And let's see. And it works. Pretty good. That's what we expect, right? We're not blocking anything at this point. We're not throttling any application. So um, big deal, really, right? It works the way it should. So it's time to go to devices and then we'll go to the QoS tab and we're gonna build a QoS policy. So give it a name. 
We add the, the proper devices. Again, you can add them all right here now, or you can come back and do it later. So again, if you purchase the platform and you've, you've got the virtual instance here, you can still go ahead and build all this out, a lot of this out, and then associate those devices later. Okay, let's add a rule. So inside to outside, the source network is gonna be the inside net. We'll give it a name and we'll set the limits. So we can do both download and upload. And we and and uh, in our case, we're gonna make the application unusable. So we're gonna use the minimum amount of throughput. Now we could have just blocked it, but then if we block it, then they call the help desk and say, hey, what's going on? If we reduce the speed to unusable, the worst thing, yes, we might still get a call, but we'll say, well, it's, use, it's working. It might be the other end, right? We can pass the buck a little bit. So let's use the application of BBC and click OK. And then we'll save. Now remember, nothing happens until we deploy. So again, lots of little attributes that we can leverage, but all we need to do is uniquely identify it. So let's go ahead and deploy this now. We could do more configuration changes, but let's ensure that we are taking a little bit, right? We're doing a little bit of changes and then we're coming back and we're testing that to make sure that the results are what is expected. All right, so let's go to connection events and we'll generate some traffic to BBC. Now, what's gonna happen? here is that it'll take forever for the page to render if it even makes if it even fully re renders right it's going to take forever um, and pages are so dynamic anymore that by the time it gets rendered it's almost useless anyway right so now i could make it usable and just throttle it right so say you know, it's uh, Olympic time, right? And you want to be able to reduce the amount of bandwidth that certain um, sites might have. Well, you can do that and make it usable, but uh, make sure that you're still not over subscribing the link with that specific application. So here we'll refresh the connection events and scroll as, uh, where, where is it here? We can see, uh, there we go, we can see the web application of BBC, there it is, Internet Explorer, the URL. We can scroll across, we see the policies that are assigned. We can see there's the QoS rule of BBC dash rate limit. And let's keep going to the QoS columns, remember we added earlier we can see it is uh, working as expected, right? Both the user experience and the logging is, uh, reflects uh, the same behavior. All right, I think it's time for a topology check, right? So we've done a lot up to this point. Um, we've got um, a fully working configuration. Um, and we're actually now starting to, you know, do a little more of the advanced capabilities, right? Like rate limiting. So let's review the topology, make sure everybody's on board of what's taking place now. So we have completed the inside to the outside network, inside to the DMZ, right? You can see both of those there. We've done the span. We've included some IPS and file policies and we're, we, we have that working solution with uh, application rate limiting. We can now move to some troubleshooting and then we'll come back and finish off the outside to the DMZ, the inline set of the PCI environment and AD integration on the inside network. So troubleshooting. All right, so let's uh, go to the devices, click the tools icon on the device of interest. Now we can see some alerts already. You can see that interface is not receiving packets. Again, what is expected at this point in time. We can then click, uh, we can dig into that specific event if we wanted to. But in our case, we're gonna go to advanced troubleshooting. 
And we're gonna start with the packet tracer. Now folks that come from ASA know the value of this, right? This is where we can build, uh, uh, or we can actually simulate traffic to see how it stacks up against our existing policies, right? So we could test whether or not a user calls and says, uh, this isn't working. We can actually enter the information in here and simulate it across, the, and it actually doesn't do anything to the box, right? It's not actually pushing traffic but it simulates the traffic, goes through the uh, all the different phases, right, that we have, um, and then validates where that drop might be. So it could be a NAT rule that's making the, the, the flow not flow, right? Uh, it could be a snort process, it could be, or snort policy, it could be an access control list, et cetera. So here I'm just, I'm gonna use Cisco Umbrella as the source. The destination is 10.1.253.100. This will be the DMZ server um, on the outside. Um, the destination port, of course, would be port 80. And at this point, I can hit start, and it'll go through and simulate that. Now you can see all the phases here, right? So what's allowed, what's not allowed. So let's focus in on here and we'll scroll down and we can see, you know, here's phase one, phase two, route lookup, phase three access list, we can see drop already, right? And then the final result, drop reason, right? Flow is denied by configured rule. Okay, fair enough. And many of you already knew that, right? It was going, why, why is he testing that? The, it, we haven't created that yet. Well, that's fine. Um, the idea here is just to show you the capabilities. So what we'll do here is, um, this is packet trace, tracer with capture. Um, so we're actually gonna push the traffic as well, okay? So this is gonna happen at the same time. So here we're gonna do, um, TCP, the host, we can put down maybe the umbrella server, right? I just need something external. Um, destination host, again, it's gonna be the same. And here you can see we can do change packet size, buffer size, stop when full, trace is on by default and then we can hit save. And you can have this here already pre-configured, right? Um, and then just turn it on when you need it. So in my case, it's it's running. And I just realized that I'm using the source host of Umbrella, which isn't gonna work because I actually am going to generate traffic from an external host. So let me go grab a host on the outside and add that here. And that's it. Remember that destination host 10.1.253.100 is actually a DMZ server. So that's just the IP address on the outside or what should be on the outside. Okay, so now we know it's running. Let's generate some traffic. And you know, I know some of you are already saying it's never gonna work, right? You haven't built policy and, and you're absolutely 100% correct. So we stop that and we can see zero packets captured. Okay, so what we need to do is create the, that policy and that NAT rule, right? We need both of them. You need the NAT rule to translate that DMZ server to the outside world, and then you need an ACL to allow the outside world to be able to communicate with that DMZ server. So the first thing that we're gonna do is create that NAT policy. So DMC to outside. And the original source is going to be the web server object that we created at the very beginning. And in this case, the original source port is HTTP. Now we're gonna create another object here. Now this object's gonna be the external IP address of that DMZ server. All right, so we give it a name and 
Don't forget to go back and grab that, right? So grab that object. So that's the translation. We know it's a static NAT. And a translated port is going to be HTTP as well. Now, we could do something else here, right? We could say 8080 on the outside and 80 on the inside, etc. Placement of the rule is very important as always, right? Have a quick review, hit save. Okay, so that's good. And again, you can see policy assignment there. If I click that, I can add additional uh, firepower devices, right? So access control list. Now this time it's outside, right, to the DMZ. But let's edit this first. Let's go in and add a rule. Outside to DMZ. Networks, it's gonna be any source. And again, we can be very granular here. We can just say, you know what? I want the web server. But the one thing to note here is you're going to use the original IP. You're not going to use the NATed IP here, okay? So there we go, www-serve. So that's 192.168.66.100. All right, so we can do, in this case, let's do ports, right? HTTP and HTTPS. Um, but again, you could do applications. I'm just showing you different ways of building policy and give it a name, right? So outside dash dub 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 inspection. Here we can add specific IPS uh, inspection rules uh, for web uh, or malware type policy, right? Or block certain files from being uploaded. So let's log it in. And again, placement is, is key, right? So just quickly review. But again, we could stretch this, we can minimize the screen, we can copy and paste policies and move them around, we can disable and enable them just by right clicking. All right, so we save that out and we're gonna deploy. There's a quick summary of the elements that we've touched. Let's go to connection events because it's time to test like everything else, right? Now, again, search can be your friend. Now, look how quick that page comes up, right? It was already um, rendered by the time we got to it. Now, we can see the event of allow, right? So there's the source, the destination. You can see that we didn't profile that outside host, right? Because we don't want to profile the outside world, right? We only have so many uh, device uh, devices depending on the Firepower management platform you have. So we don't want to waste them. So topology check time. So outside to, or inside to outside, inside to DMZ, we know the span is complete. We know outside to DMZ is complete. We've done some rate limiting. We've done some IPS and file policy. And we have the PCI network and the AD integration portion left. But let's go back to that capture. Remember earlier we did that capture and we weren't seeing anything. But now we know the connection is there. So let's go ahead and refresh this a couple times. I just want to close the loop on these things, right? I want to show you it wasn't working and the reason why it wasn't working and then how to get it working, right? I want to make sure that you get some insight into as much as possible. So you can see here's, you know, the packet captured and then here's the um, packet tracer. So we can scroll down you can see all the phases here. Connection settings allow, NAT allow, per session, scroll down. Let's go down to the very bottom, sort and, snort inspect is allow and snort verdict is allow, okay? And the final result is allow. Perfect, that's exactly what we expect. All right, wow, we've done a lot up to this point, right? So let's go now and build out that inline set. Now, these hosts are on the same layer three network. 
and we want to introduce controls and perhaps some inspection. So you can see the firewall on these boxes are, have been disabled, but I can't ping either one of them, right? And in my case, I'm using VMware. So on the vSwitch, these are actually two separate uh, port groups, VLAN 198 and VLAN 98. And what I'm gonna use is I'm gonna use the inline set to tie them together to make sure that they're both on the same uh, broadcast domain and that they can communicate with each other, right? They have to hit the firepower threat defense to go through, but at least they can communicate. Now you can do that physically with an inline set as well in an environment, but I have virtual switch and it's a, a lab and that's why I've done it this way. So we do inline A to B and B to Z, or B to A, sorry. Um, and then we'll grab our objects here, right? Again, we're gonna do it very specific to the host itself. And we're gonna say from the you know, host one to host two, to host two, to host one, right? So all we're doing is inspecting. Now, this could be as simple as just putting uh, additional intrusion and file policies on it with an access control list that's very tight in regards to what it can communicate as. Um, and it's just adding a layer of control that you might not have otherwise. So let's add ICMP. Here is the application. And again, we could have done some advanced inspection as well, and we're gonna log at end of connection. And rule placement, again, as always is important. If you're not sure if uh, a, a, um, a rule is working properly, you can always go back to packet tracer, right? And run that packet tracer to find out where it was blocked. All right, so we'll save that out. Everything looks good there. Then we can deploy. Like always, right? Everybody's reading my mind at this point, right? We've got to go back and look at the connection events. So once this deploys, those pings that we're doing will start obviously getting a return, right? As opposed to um, timing out. Um, so in this case, let's go ahead and get the policy uh, or the event connection event search criteria down. And let's go into the ingress security zone. And what we'll do is we'll grab the either the A and the B, right? So we don't care as long as it matches either one of those uh, we want to search on. Uh, we want those events to be shown. And let's reload. And at the same time, let's go ahead and look at those two hosts. Oh, look at that already, right? We're already seeing that uh, the one side, one side is communicating and so is the other side. So fantastic. So again, these are two um, hosts being tied together with an inline set on the same layer three network. So you can see here, uh, you know, echo request, the code, the application protocol, etc. All right, time to check the topology. So we have completed inside to outside, right? Inside uh, to DMZ, outside to DMZ, the span. We've got the PCI network uh, complete. We included IPS and file policies and have a working solution including application rate limiting and covered some basic troubleshooting. So the last step now is Active Directory integration on the inside network. So let's go to systems integration and we need to add a realm. So we're getting really close to the end here folks. And I know it's a lot, but hopefully this helps get a good understanding of you know how to build policy, some of the more of the advanced configurations, even though this is a 101 type uh, uh, session. Here I'm using administrator. In your environment, most likely you're gonna create a service account. So you do this for the AD join username, password, and the directory username and, and password as well.
Then you will configure the base DN, distinguish name, and the group distinguish name. So in my case, I'm using it at the root, right? So anything under that, I want included. You can be very specific if you want. You can see the example on the side where it includes the OU. And then click OK. Now the Realm allows us to add uh, user objects to uh, policy. So let's put in the uh, directory server. So the uh, AD server itself. And you can hit test and hit OK. So that's it there, right? You could do uh, TLS, etc., cetera, right? Uh, LDAP S or whatever. Um, I, I did in there. Realm configuration, we're not touching. User download, but you can tweak some things in there, right? So again, based on your environment, you may want to do that. Now, user download, again, just because you can select everything, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you're not using those objects. So pick the objects that you're going to use, right? So in our case, sales and HR is gonna be the focus, but I'm just showing you I could do policy with the main admins as well, right? I can also exclude groups. So here I'm gonna save this out. And the big thing here, folks, is to hit that enable, right? A lot of people miss this. Hit enable, and if I hit this little download button here, it'll actually go out and download those groups. Now, those groups now are available in policy, so I can actually use them to build policy. The challenge is, is that I don't have the user to IP mappings. So in order to do that, we use an agent for that, right? So that marries the IP address to the uh, user uh, ID. Now, moving forward, you want to leverage Identity Services Engine or our Identity Services Engine, uh, our, our PIC platform. So both of those are going to centralize user to IP mappings uh, for all of our security products. Instead of having one for each uh, different security product doing it different ways, this is to consolidate that. So let's add that um, Cisco Firepower user agent. So it's .202. And that's it on this side, right? We save that out and, and that's it. The rest is, is that we've got to go and build out that application, right? Or that service. So let's go to the Windows box, right? That we're going to be running it on. And go ahead and let's find the installation. I have it in the downloads directory. And this is going to install the agent, right? Obviously. Um, but what what does the agent include? Well, it includes SQL Compact Server 3.5 SP2 and the agent itself. So follow the wizard. Um, and then once that's complete, we'll do the final configuration to make sure that we're getting the IP to user mappings. And this will take a second or two. Um, but every time I say that, it's like done, right? So here we go again. So hit, hit next. And then you'll hit next here. And now we have the application. We'll hit close. And we can go ahead and open that now. And we're going to enter the Firepower Management uh, Center IP address and the domain name uh, we are using. But first, I'm going to add the Active Directory server. So again, we are using administrator. You would use a uh, service account uh, for this. And go ahead and click add. Just double check. Just making sure I'm not using this IP. Okay, perfect. And we're going to process real-time events as well. So we'll add this in. And now, again, we can hit save. Um, or you could, uh, you know, continue on to the next task. Like I said earlier, I have a habit of always um, saving, uh, coming from the command line. 
So here we give an IP address of Firepower Management Center and hit add. Now everything should turn green in here, right? All right, so there's the, the, the green there for the FMC and AD, that's good. Uh, we could uh, make sure logs go to the Windows application log, for example. We could come in here and stop and start the uh, service. And here the logout frequency. So we wanna know when people log out, right? So then we can make sure that the right user gets married to the right IP address sooner. Um, in my case, because it's a lab, I'm just gonna turn it down to one minute. You would obviously select what's relevant to your organization. All right, so now that we've got the Realm and the Firepower user agent configured, we can build out that identity policy. So we'll add a new policy. Let's add a rule. This is gonna be inside to outside and inside to DMZ, so both. We'll grab the inside network as a source. We'll give it a name. And we will use passive authentication And we'll need to select the realm. So this will be the realm that we just created. Right? And there's some additional things that we could do, right? Active authentication, etc. But in this case, we're using passive. So go ahead and add this rule at this point. And it's the only rule, so we don't we're not worried about uh, placement. And we can see here a quick summary, hit save. Now this is still doing nothing. Right, Everything that we've done up to now hasn't done anything for identity Right, when we want to actually leverage it in policy. We have to go and add this to access control policy, just like we did with IPS and just like we did with file or malware policy, right? So click edit. You see pre-filter policy. We see SSL policy. Now we see the identity policy. So let's grab that identity and now it's available for us to use, right? So now it's gonna do the user to IP mappings as well as uh, it's gonna allow us to grab the users and groups. All right, so let's go ahead and build policy. Now we've zoomed in here at times and it's made it difficult to see things or better to see things, but now it's crunch it. So I've used the control minus key, just so you know, to shrink the page uh, properly. Um, and now we'll add a rule. So again, give it a name. This is gonna be the HR policy. The actions allowed. So inside to outside and DMZ, Okay, the inside net object is gonna be the source. And this time we're gonna use the users, right? So Cisco AD, and now we can see there's that HR. Now we can do a specific user, but in our case, we're gonna use the group. Now we can go in and be, again, a little more granular depending on the policy, right? We could add IPS and file policy to this. And now we'll log at end of connections. And we'll hit add, but remember the placement's important, right? And as we go along, you're gonna see there's a point where um, it actually placement does bite me and I explain that in a second. So go ahead and hit add. Again, you could uh, review your policy here. And you can see I drag and drop it uh, to move the policy. So that's pretty cool that you can do that. Um, what I'll come to find is, is that I actually have to move it a little bit further up. Um, but here nor there, right? That's why we're testing. And now I've copied that policy. So I'm gonna call this sales policy. So HR basically is allowed to go anywhere. The sales individual though is gonna be restricted. So this will be block DMZ. So we'll change that to block. Now one thing, and I did this on purpose, right, is that 
you got to be very careful when you're copying policy, right? Because I've, I've got here inside zone to outside zone and DMZ, okay? So I'll go through the process, but what I come to find is that I don't want to block the outside, right? So let's get rid of the user, add the correct user for this policy. But these are things you got to remember, right? When copying policy, you might want to go through every tab that's edited and uh, make sure that it makes sense. And because this is a block policy, you can only log at beginning, right? Because there is no end of connection because we don't let the connection establish. So click save. And we can see here, there's the sales policy. We'll paste the allow policy, so the first one's a block. This one's gonna be an allow, but we need to edit it first. And this is actually at the point where I realized, wait a minute, this is a, this one's the allow. I gotta go back and clean up the other policy. So we want this to be um, inside to outside. Inside net, and the user is sales and logging. Well, we could add some inspection because remember, this is allow policy. Uh, and now we want this at end of connection. Again, a couple little attributes that depending on the rule set, um, it may need to be modified. Now let's go back and clean up this one, right? We only want to block to the DMZ. All right, so now we've got these policies, right? We can quickly review them. So inside to DMZ, inside network sales, inside zone. Okay, these all look good. But make sure you review them before you deploy them, right? And again, I'll clarify in a second because anybody that you know pauses and really focuses on the policy is gonna notice that how did it work, right? But I actually had to go back and mo uh, move the policies because I was overriding. And I'll explain that in one second. Um, but first, let's get that deployed and let's get the connection events up and ready. And we're gonna open up two uh, windows for the connection events. And this is gonna allow us to be able to look at the user and HR uh, users very specifically. So we wanna edit the search. And we're gonna select the proper user, right, initiator user. So the first one will be HR. And actually that should be HR1. So we're gonna probably have to come back and edit that. Uh, and this one will be sales one. Again, you can pivot if you want to with the sections over there. This is where I realized sales one. And let's go to the first one and put HR one. Okay, search. And you can save them. Remember I said earlier that you can save all your predefined searches so you don't have to keep building these each time. All right, so I wanna clarify that I had to go back and reorder the rule as I had issues with the inside to DMZ rule higher up taking precedence and not allowing a match. Okay, so that was my biggest challenge. So we're starting to see traffic come in. Um, you can see the connection events, right? But let's go ahead and let's get these hosts up and running. And let's do some testing. So the HR user, This is where that I was mentioning the policy, right? I had to move uh, some things around to make sure that they were um, properly in order. And let me shrink the page here so you can see it a little bit better. So that uh, you have to make sure that you don't have a policy higher up overriding a, maybe a more granular policy, right? So just, again, always make sure that you've got the policy in the right place.
but as you're copying and things like that, you you sometimes will make uh, some mistakes because you're trying to streamline the process or configuration. Um, but at the same time, there might be a you know an element that needs to be uh, changed, and you forget to change it. So both HR and sales can get to the internet. So that's good. That's an expected behavior. Now let's double check. Okay, HR one is on the right side and sales one is on the left side. So HR can get to outside and it can get to the DMZ. Now sales can get to outside, eh, wait, wait a minute, and the, the, no, they're not supposed to. Okay, remember caching, right? Caching can bite you, connection events or connection, the timing of that connection might also bite you. In this case, uh, I just had to refresh um, and it was blocked. So as you can see, the user side, uh, the behavior is expected, right? We got the results that we uh, are expecting based on the policy that we configured. Now let's reload these connection events. And remember the difference, connection with application details you can see here, but you can't see the user identity, right? So let's go to table events, because table events is gonna allow us to see uh, the user identity. And again, remember, you can add columns, right? Very specific columns, and you can save or, or what we call or bookmark these searches too, right? So now we can see there's the sales, there's an allow policy, and the top one's a block, right? So that's exactly what we expected, right? They were allowed to go to the internet, but they're not allowed to go to the DMZ, which is the 192.168.66.100. And again, you can see all the details. We capture you know, a significant amount of, of attributes. Now HR, we can see is allowed, right? All right, so in summary, we've completed inside to outside. We can, uh, we've also done um, inside the DMZ. We've done spanner tap segment. We built inline sets with PCI network. We've done the outside to the DMZ. We included IPS policies and file policies. We included auto dynamic NAT and manual static NAT. Uh, we did a bunch of testing throughout. This concludes the session. And remember, this is a small snippet of the power of Cisco Firepower Threat Defense Platform. Thank you.